Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. Hello, I'm Christine Beck. I'm the current Poet Laureate of the town of West Hartford, and I want to welcome you to our regular series called Poetry Around the Town. This series began when I became Poet Laureate, and we are going to be continuing it until approximately May of 2017, when hopefully the next Poet Laureate will be continuing this uh, series to introduce you to events that involve poetry and also the love of poetry. So I primarily view my, um, my mission as your town Poet Laureate as someone who can introduce you to the appreciation of poetry. And so please don't turn off your channel. <laughs> please give me a chance. I know you may think I don't like poetry. I felt exactly the same way in the year 2000 when I wrote my first poem. I was a practicing lawyer and I had no use for poetry. However, I have been convinced otherwise and I hope to convince you otherwise. So please do stay tuned. What I'd like to do um, in this uh, session is to discuss with you a few poems that are all linked together by a common theme or topic. So when we say to ourselves, what is this poem about? Sometimes we first talk about the topic of the poem. These poems are linked together by a topic of spiders and moths, which may seem um, insignificant or not terribly interesting, Again, I hope to convince you otherwise. But the other thing we have to remember about poetry is that the topic is not really what the poem is about. What the poem is about is creating an emotional experience that ties you, the reader or the listener, into some question, some important issue that lies below the topic or the theme of the poem. So as we look at these poems, we'll be kind of examining, well, what's this poem really about? And I assert that the best poems pose questions, but not necessarily answers. And that's why we like to read them again and again, because each time we come to the poem, we might get a slightly different take on what that answer might be. So the first poem I'd like to share with you, and I, I hope you'll be seeing a, a copy of the poem splashed on your screen while I'm reading so you can actually see the words of the poem on the page. The first poem is called A Noiseless Patient Spider. It's a poem by Walt Whitman. Um, Walt Whitman is frequently referred to as the father of American poetry, as Emily Dickinson is referred to as the mother of American poetry. You can agree or disagree about that. What is clear is that Walt Whitman was a really important poet in shifting the form of American poetry from one that was rhymed and metered, think um, Edgar Allan Poe, uh, The Raven, for example. Well, what Walt Whitman did is he got rid of rhyme, he got rid of iambic pentameter, you know, measuring his words out by the way they were stressed, he wrote very long lines. He wrote what some would say was kind of stream of consciousness in terms of his topics so that we weren't always completely clear what he was talking about. And um, he, at, during his lifetime, was not a particularly <laughs> a popular poet because he really was making a sea change in the way poetry was written. Interestingly enough, when the beat poets came on the scene, they picked up many of the same strategies that Walt Whitman used in his poetry. The stream of consciousness, the very long lines, the extremely long poems. So this is a short poem, 
and it was part of a Whitman's uh, seminal work called uh, Leaves of Grass, um, a, noiseless, a Noiseless Patient uh, Spider, written in 1868. A noiseless patient spider, I marked where on a little promontory it stood isolated, marked how to explore the vacant, vast surrounding, it launched forth filament, filament, filament out of itself, ever unreeling them, ever tirelessly speeding them. And you, O oh my soul, where you stand, surrounded, detached, in measureless oceans of space, ceaselessly musing, venturing, throwing, seeking the spheres to connect them, till the bridge you will need be formed, till the ductile anchor hold, till the gossamer thread you fling catch somewhere, O oh my soul. So you can see that the entrance to this poem is about a spider, yes? And in fact, Waltman says that in the title, a noiseless patient spider. But in the second stanza of this poem, suddenly another character comes in, and the new character is my soul, and oh, my soul, where you stand. Now, what Whitman is doing in that second stanza is he is drawing a parallel. He is in some way offering us, the reader, to think about, well, how is his soul like a spider? Hmm. Not on its face something we would ordinarily compare. So we're, we're immediately kind of off balance, right? And he's gone from the very, very small, the spider, to something huge. Because what he's saying is the soul is detached in measureless oceans of space. So now we have this soul kind of floating around in the cosmos. And what is the soul doing? The soul is acting like a spider. It's trying to find a way to connect itself, to make a bridge, which is a word he uses in the second to the last line, a bridge to connect it in some way into the universe. And then he says, um, till the ductile anchor hold. Now, some of us have to look up the word ductile. I did. And ductile means very thin hammered uh, metal something very, very thin, malleable, in many respects, like the spider's web, you know, the, the filament of the spider's web. But it, that doesn't go with anchor, right? How is an anchor like something that is so thin and, um, and malleable? Well, that is an oxymoron, right? A malleable anchor, a thin, thread-like anchor. How could that be? And that's one of the tools that the poet uses to ask us to think about, hmm, wonder what he means by that, right? Till the gossamer thread you fling catch somewhere, O oh my soul. So this is, a, this is a poem of longing. This is a poem of the soul longing to connect and longing to be like the spider, yes? And so we have here a very large metaphysical contemplation put alongside a spider. And that, of course, is something that Whitman is, is known for. He's known for addressing the soul, talking about the soul. He's not giving us easy answers. And he's not actually saying that the soul will find a way to connect itself. But that is the longing. The longing is to find a connection in the cosmos. And that's one of the reasons why we want to go back and read that poem again. So I recommend that you do so. The second poem I'm going to read, also by a very famous American poet, is called Design. It's by Robert Frost. It's an Italian sonnet, and it was written in 1936. So now we're shifting to, a, to back to a style of poetry that, in fact, was a hallmark of Shakespeare, right, the sonnet. It is rhymed. Uh, Robert Frost was a master of rhyme. What I tell my students is, please do not try to rhyme your poems. Why? Because your, your desire for that rhyme, that end rhyme, is going to take over your good sense and you're going to choose a word that doesn't work. You're going to pick a word for the sound and not for the sense. What Robert Frost was a master of is combining sound and sense so that those rhymes feel 
effortless. Um, I myself work with internal rhyme. I don't work with end rhyme because I'm, I'm no Robert Frost and I know it. So this is written a number of years after Walt Whitman, clearly with the knowledge of the Walt Whitman poem. I mean, every time we read a, a, a poem by a contemporary poet, we know that in general, that poet is aware of the kind of talisman famous poems that came before. So this is design, and it also is about spiders and moths. I found a dimpled spider, fat and white, on a white heel all holding up a moth, like a white piece of rigid satin cloth. Assorted characters of death and blight, mixed, ready to begin the morning right, like the ingredients of a witch's broth, a snowdrop spider, a flower like a froth, and dead wings carried like a paper kite. What had that flower to do with being white, the wayside blue and innocent heel all? What brought the kindred spider to that height, then steered the white moth thither in the night? What but design of darkness to appall, if design govern in a thing so small? Now, a couple words to say about the sonnet. First of all, the second stanza of the sonnet generally involves a turn. Now, in the Whitman poem, we saw that there was a turn from the spider to the soul, yes? So we actually turned from one, from looking at one actual image to contemplating something that the soul has no image. In this sonnet, Robert Frost stays with the image of the spider. He doesn't change his image, but he changes his tone. He changes his point of view. So in the first part of this sonnet, he is simply describing what he sees. In the second part, he's asking questions. And it is those questions that change the tone and that introduce what I would call the meditation of the poem. That's where we're invited in to think about, oh, so what does this image of this white spider, unusual, right? sitting on a flower called a heel all, which is typically blue, but in this case is white, with a white moth. So we have three white things, all kind of lined up like ghosts, perhaps. And he tells us that it is, uh, it is assorted characters of death and blight. So he tells us at the very beginning, <laughs> we're not meant to see this as a pretty bucolic scene. His questions, however, ask about design. So to ask about design, there has to be a designer. Somebody has to design the design. Who is the designer? Who do you think? I mean, it strikes me that, that Frost is asking us to think about, is there a design to the cosmos? Is there a design to the universe? Did someone or something actually design a system where Spiders eat moths, and where we have characters of death and blight. Was that designed? Was that by design? And he says in the second to the last line, what but design of darkness to appall? So he is contemplating some, some designer that is dark, some designer that has perhaps evil or, or maybe just the, the, random, uh, the random nature of the food chain in mind. And then he says, if design govern in a thing so small. Now, is this spider really so small? Or are we assorted characters of death and blight? And is he actually saying that ironically? Is that an irony at the end? If design govern in a thing so small. These are questions for us to think about as we look at the poem, think about the poem, and try to respond to the poem and the questions that it's asking us. But questions are an extremely important tool in the poet's toolbox because they help us to uh, not have easy answers. And Frost certainly did not have easy answers uh, for himself or for us as readers. So another poem about spiders and moths. 
Now I'm going to read a poem by Mary Oliver. Mary Oliver is probably as well known as Billy Collins. I would say if there are two best known contemporary uh, poets today, it would be uh, Mary Oliver and Billy Collins. Mary Oliver is known as a poet who writes a lot about the natural world, but her meditations about the natural world are always meant to open up something in us. They're meant to ask us to think about our own lives. Yeah. I mean, she has one poem that says, what, what are you going to do with your one wild and precious life? That's the last line of her poem after she's been looking at a dragonfly. So she really is calling us to, uh, to be in the world in a way that matters. So it's called The Moths. There's a kind of white moth, I don't know what kind, that glimmers by mid-May in the forest just as the pink moccasin flowers are rising. If you notice anything, it leads you to notice more and more. And anyway, I was so full of energy, I was always running around looking at this and that. If I stopped, the pain was unbearable. If I stopped and thought, maybe the world can't be saved, the pain was unbearable. So we have a beautiful opening stanza. We have a lovely scene with moths. The moths are important because they're the title. We know titles are not random. She didn't just throw that title on. And she's talking about noticing things that are leading you to notice more things. And then she says, very interestingly, I was always running around looking at this and looking at that. Why? Because she couldn't stop. Why? Because if she did stop and think, she was in pain. And the pain was about whether the world can be saved. Obviously a very contemporary poem having to do with our world, um, the species that go extinct every day, how we care for our world. These are issues that are important to Mary Oliver. But she's also got this really important meditation in the middle about the personal responsibility of the individual to stop and think, even if the pain is unbearable, even if the pain is unbearable. She knows that by running around and looking at this and that, she is not doing her job. She's not doing the job of being human, of being human in the natural world. And I think that's one of the gifts of Mary Oliver. So I really recommend that if you haven't read her work before that you, that you take a look um, because it's very powerful work. And finally, I'm going to shift tone, but not topic to a poem by Tom Lux called Tarantulas. Tom Lux, like Billy Collins, has a, an ironic stance that he takes in his poems, but underneath his poems, there's always something resonating that is of essence, the essence of being human. And so we're not meant to just laugh and laugh it off. Uh, Billy Collins says, laugh till it hurts. And I think that Thomas Lux would probably own that, that little saying as well. So I'm going to read you Tarantulas. For some semi-tropical reason, when the rains fall relentlessly, they fall into swimming pools, these otherwise bright and scary arachnids. They can swim a little, but not for long, and they can't climb the ladder out. They usually drown. But if you want their favor, if you believe there is justice, a reward for not loving the death of ugly and even dangerous, the eel, hog, snake, rats, creatures, if you believe these things, then you would leave a life boy or two in your swimming pool at night. And in the morning, you would haul ashore the huddled, hairy survivors and escort them back to the bush. And no, be assured that at least these saved as individuals would not turn up again someday in your hat, drawer, or the tangled underworld of your socks. And that even when your belief in justice merges with your belief in dreams, they may tell the others in a sign language four times as subtle and complicated as man's, that you are good, that you love them, that you would save them again. 
So at the top level, the level of what is this poem about, Tom Lux seems to be saying, you should go out and rescue the tarantulas that fall into your swimming pool because then uh, they will love you and they won't come hide in your sock drawer. Which strikes us as being amusing. And as I say, Tom Lux is an amusing poet. But he's given us a number of hints that things are not quite as amusing as perhaps they first appear. The first is the word justice. The word justice appears in this poem twice. Justice normally doesn't seem to go with rescuing tarantulas out of your swimming pool. It seems like a very big word for, am I going to rescue the tarantulas? So when I see the word justice, I immediately think, hmm, wonder what else these tarantulas might remind me of. And for me, as perhaps for you, I have an image of all these tarantulas clustered around this circular life buoy, and I suddenly think of the boat people. And I suddenly think of the refugees, and I think of the little boats bobbing around in the water, and I think of rescuing them. And I don't know if Tom Lux was thinking about that or not. That's one of the beauties of poetry. It doesn't matter. He's left a space for me. He has left an opening for me and for you to jump in and think about, hmm, what's the relationship between tarantulas and justice? That's odd. And I think that's one of his gifts as a poet. The other thing that's interesting is he's planted a detail, uh, and he does a lot of research for his poetry. His detail is in the second to the last stanza that the tarantulas speak in a sign language four times as subtle and complicated as man's. So he's asking us to think about, oh, so actually tarantulas are more sophisticated than humans, at least in this issue of their communication. Well, what are we to make of that detail? Why is it there? It's not random. He didn't just throw that in because he did a lot of research and he wanted us to know what he found out about tarantulas. Oh, and by the way, he said something about uh, uh, dangerous, the death of ugly and even dangerous creatures. So I did some research and it turns out tarantulas are not particularly dangerous, although we think of them as dangerous. And maybe that's also something that we could work on a little bit as we decode, decipher what's really going on underneath the top level of this poem. But what he says in addition is, if you believe there is justice, a reward for not loving, and look at that in Jammin, a reward for not loving. Why would there be a reward for not loving? There should be a reward for loving, yes? He's playing with us because he's letting us hover just so slightly on that word loving, and then it goes over to loving the death of ugly and even dangerous creatures. Oh, oh, now I see. So he's playing with me. And that's, again, one of the gifts of the poet, is the poet can ask me to look at two different things at once, right? So a reward for not loving the death, for not loving the death of something that is ugly and dangerous. So now he's positing, do I think there is? Is there a reward? And if there's a reward, where does that reward come from? Where, where do we get that reward? Again, it's not as overt, I would say, as Whitman wondering about the soul or Frost wondering about the designer of the universe or perhaps Mary Oliver asking us to think about our busyness versus our obligation, if there is one, to stop and think about can the world be saved? Those are very big questions, right? This question is about loving the death of the ugly and dangerous. And yet, something about this really calls to me. And that is one of the beauties of poetry that at first blush might look a bit mm, slight. This is not a slight poem. Tom Lux is not a slight poet. And at the very end of the poem, the tarantulas in their very subtle sign language, are going to tell each other something. They're going to tell each other that you are good, that you love them, that you would save them again. 
Now, on, on one level, that's funny, right? The tarantula saying, yeah, that guy that you know, threw me the life, the life boy, he, you know, he'd save me again. But is Tom Lux asking us about saving something again? And if he's asking us about saving something again, what might it be? So I hope you've enjoyed kind of examining a few spider and moth poems with me. Um, I want to remind you that um, I have the privilege of hosting a series at the Hartford Public Library of the last Saturday of every month. It's called Poets on Poetry. And um, you can find the information on the Connecticut Poetry Society website, which is ctpoetry.net. We will be talking about Walt Whitman in May, May 20. Um, another poet, Victor Altschul, and I will be debating Walt Whitman. He, he said, I don't like Walt Whitman. Okay, so Victor's going to convince you not to like Walt Whitman. I have the pleasant duty of convincing you to like Walt Whitman. And you know what? Either one is just fine because we can get a lot out of a poet we don't like. We really can. So um, please let me know if there's a poet um, or poem you'd like to hear me discuss. You can contact me on my Facebook page, which is Poetry in West Hartford. Or you can go to my website, which is christinebeck.net. And you can leave me a message and let me know what poems you might want to hear talked about, what poems perhaps link together in your mind. And um, in particular, perhaps a poem that you thought was about one thing. But now in further reflection, you're thinking it might be about another. Because that, my friends, is the beauty of poetry. And that is part of my mission as your West Hartford Poet Laureate. So thank you for being with me, and please tune in again.